I'm John o. Buchanan. Now, what we're going to do within this episode is we're going to take a step back in time. I do that all the time, don't I? To a time when I was first a Logic user, and as we've established, dinosaurs roamed the Earth and man hadn't yet discovered fire. And at that time, there was an amazing window which I used all the time within Logic, which was referred to as the Hyper Editor. Now, this particular technique is one that I used to use all the time when I was working with external um, hardware. So when Logic wasn't even Logic Audio yet and was just a sequencer rather than in any Anyway, a workstation capable of recording audio or hosting internal software instruments. What would happen, of course, is that people like me and other people who are working in studios would have racks of synthesizers, which we would access over MIDI. We'd plug in our MIDI cables through our MIDI interface, and Logic would effectively provide this place where we had a kind of central hub for all of our sequencing. And what I wanted to be able to do when I was working that way was to open up a Logic project and have all of the MIDI settings that I was using across my hardware recall immediately. So I would use things called program change messages, which sent messages from Logic to the hardware to recall the specific sounds or patches that I was using. But what I also wanted to do was to send MIDI messages to recreate a balance of a mix. In other words, what I could do would be to use MIDI controller messages to set volume, to set pan, to set modulation amounts, all sorts of parameters that basically recalled my mix and allowed my mix to flow in much the same way that we require automation to do that for us these days. Well, what we're going to do today is to take a step back in time in order to look at a different way of doing something that we've explored in other ways on the channel before. And of course, this is a thing that's going to happen more and more as we get further into this logic series, that what I'm going to do is to present to you alternative ways of being able to do things that you might be doing in a different way already. Why am I going to do that? Well, for a start, we all explore different workflows and enjoy different ways of working. And it's also true that every once in a while, switching up the way that we work often yields really interesting, unexpected results. So what we're going to need, first of all, is a synth part for it. I've fired up this pad sound called Amber Dark, which is an alchemy patch, and I'm just going to record four chords for it. Now, what I'm also going to do, because I want them to be all the same velocity, velocity in this sound is controlling volume, but it's also controlling the brightness of the sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix velocities. I'm going to slightly offset them so they're just kind of at 74. A velocity, um, a dynamics, a fixed dynamics takes all velocities to 64, and I'm just going to add a little bit of extra on top, and I'm going to use Control N to normalize that so it becomes kind of baked into the, the sequence, and it now sounds like this. And we've got a slightly dreamier, more muted thing, which is nice. OK, so I've mentioned the Hyper Editor. It doesn't exist anymore. But what we do have is the opportunity to open up a window, which is referred to as the Step Editor. And this used to be the Hyper Editor. And why they've changed the name, I don't really know, because there are lots of steps within Logic already. And Hyper is a great word, but turns out, no. So what I'm going to do is to open up this editor, and we suddenly get greeted with this curious looking screen. What am I actually looking at here? Well, what I've got is a lane for every event that exists within my project. And at the moment, the only events are note events. In other words, what I've got is a lane for each note within my sequence. Another way of looking at data within Logic. Remember, we've also got the piano roll display, we've got the event list, and now we've got the step editor, whose name used to be better. I'm going to try not to say that again. So what I've got a chance to see here is firstly the velocity of each of the notes that exist within my sequence, and if I kind of think about it, I've got a weird way of being able to look at the chords. So in other words, the first chord is made up of a C, an E, a B, and a G. 
These don't seem to be in any particular order either. Why B2 would be there when it's the lowest note, I don't really understand, but that's fine. So what we've got is this chord, and then it turns out that those two notes are also in the second chord, but now we get a G and an A, and so on and so forth. So I have a chance to see the notes, but I haven't really come here to do note editing because I can think of better places to do that. But what this is introducing is the idea that we've got a lane for every single MIDI event. So it stands to reason that what I might do would be able to create a new lane. And in fact, I can. I'm going to click, click down here at the bottom. And what I'm then going to do is to come to the little lanes menu, which is here. And I want to create a new lane. Turns out there's a key command for that as well. But we're just going to do that directly within this menu, create lane. And I get a new lane. And it's a duplicate of the previous one. I've now got another lane labeled for G2. Well, firstly, I don't want to edit notes here. And secondly, I definitely don't need a duplicate of notes. What I need to do instead is to assign this lane to the thing that I want to control. And the thing that I want to control is not a note message over here, but instead what I want to do is to choose a controller number, a MIDI controller number. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this across to control, and that will now stop being G2. And instead it becomes the very excitingly labeled open brackets, hashtag 23 LSB, close brackets, MIDI. I love it. You love it too. What we're then going to do is recognize that, of course, by switching this across to a control message, what that accompanies is a controller number. And it turns out that that's what number 55 is, this extraordinarily named little thing here. What I'm going to do is to swap this out for another number. Now, none of these are actually labeled, so you kind of need to know a little bit about your MIDI assignments to choose a parameter that makes sense to what this part might be. A MIDI controller number seven controls volume. And straight away, when I select number seven, volume is added to the lane name. Wouldn't it be useful if those names for particular MIDI controllers were written next to these numbers? Over to you, Apple. OK, so what we've now got is a volume lane. OK, so what does that mean? Well, what it means is that I can, using the pencil tool, which is available to me in all the usual ways, just press T and select the pencil tool, I then have an opportunity to create volume data. OK, what I mean is this. I'm going to create one message right at the beginning, which is at a volume of 127. What I'm then going to do is to draw one in the next 16th note, which is at a volume of 28. And what I can do from one square to another is just create a little ramp or series of offset steps where we get a chance to draw a kind of volume pattern. And remember, rather than just being on or off, what I have a chance to do is to select on, off or 128 steps in between those two positions. Well, 126 steps if I use on and off, but you get the point, 128 steps in total, which is going to give me a chance to just kind of create quite an interesting little sequence. So what I'm going to do is to kind of make this a little bit random in terms of exactly what I want volume to do. And then we'll see exactly what happens when we play it back. So again, what I am going to do here is just to create a little series of offsets. And if I want to, I can create a few of those in a row by just dragging over a number of them at once. Anything that I don't like the look of, of course, I can just click and change. So what we can do is, let's say, have a ramp down here and a ramp back up there. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so I can see my whole sequence at once. And then what we'll do is just have a little climb into here, maybe a nice little up ramp there. Are you still with me? You can have a little cup of tea. This is a cup of tea moment for you guys. Coffee is also available. And often even more useful. OK, so what we've now got is a step edit sequence where this is going to be my volume line. Now, of course, if this is reminding you of the sorts of things that we can do with volume data or automation, then, of course, it's just another way of being able to do that. But of course, this is now MIDI volume. What I'm going to do is make it a little bit smaller so we can see the sequence behind it as well. And then I'm going to press play, which is what you've been waiting for.
isn't that nice. Now you might be thinking, well, hang on, why did it just suddenly block out at loud when I went back to the beginning? Well, remember, all of these squares are outputting a little bit of MIDI data. So it stands to reason that if I press stop and go back to the beginning, the most recent bit of data it's receiving is this first one here, which means the volume is going to climb and it's going to stay there. Remember, this isn't a delay effect. This is MIDI volume. It's a controller message sending to the volume of Alchemy and it's controlling it there which means, of course, that it, we could add further lanes of data. So long as MIDI controllers are mapped to useful parameters, we can do anything within this window. So I'm going to come back to the lanes area again. I'm going to create another new lane. And this time, I'm going to choose a different type of controller. Again, it's going to duplicate the most recent one, which means I get a perfect copy of that. But of course, this time what I want to do is to have a pitch bend message instead. So I'm going to change away from controllers and instead I'm going to use pitch bend. Immediately all of that data will disappear because of course we don't have pitch bend data until now. And the reason why I've chosen pitch bend is because of course, rather than loud and soft, whereby the highest message is the most prominent one and then quiet ones or lower ones are quieter, which is what we have with volume, of course pitch bend needs to be centered in the middle. Suddenly, for some reason, it just jumped to this position. I have no idea why. It did. Let's just go with it. So what I need to do is to create a pitch bend message right in the middle at zero, which of course is going to reset the pitch bend to the middle, if you like. And then what I'm going to do is just to have a couple of messages here where the pitch is just going to slightly drop off a tiny bit as we come into bar two. I just want a little bit of pitch bend drop and then I'm going to do something similar here. Now what I'm trying to do is to make sure that the first message I draw is at zero and then from that point I'm just making sure each one ramps up a tiny bit and then I'm going to reset that at zero. I don't really know how much um, this is going to produce a pitch bend rate, uh, change because actually I don't really know the pitch bend range of the alchemy patch that I've selected. If it's two, in other words, a full tone in either direction, these are very subtle little offsets. If it turns out that the pitch bend range is two octaves, a tiny amount of this is still going to make a really big difference. Again, slightly random. I have no idea what the outcome is going to be, but you know, sometimes that's exactly where we want to be, isn't it? So I'm going to just draw this time a series of little steps and that one can just do that. And then I think what we'll do is to keep it at zero the whole way through that last bar. Let's have a listen. And that's giving us this really nice little tapey effect because it's just a little bit off, if you like. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just run this with uh, the other sounds within my mix. I've got a bass line and a couple of drum parts too. I really like that. Now, of course, I could assign any MIDI controllers here that I like. So if, for instance, what I want to do is to, if or at least if I know that, let's say my modulation wheel is controlling something useful within Alchemy, it's opening up the filter, let's say, of course, what I could do would be to set up controller number one, modulation, and then I could draw a line for it. Equally, I might decide that what I want to do is to have the sound dance from one side of the stereo mix to the other, in which case I could create a MIDI controller 10 lane, which will control pan. It's annoying 
that those parameters aren't labeled in the way that they might be. But a little bit of experimentation is going to quickly show you what each individual MIDI controller does. And of course, what we also know is that what we can do within synths like Alchemy and the ES2 is to choose any MIDI controller number we like and assign it to a specific parameter. And then within this step editor, what I have a chance to do is to create a series of really dynamic layers for that, individual patterns, if you like, which can evolve over time. So I think this is a window that we're going to dust off, bring back into our workflow and do interesting things with, even if it isn't any more called the high predator. What a shame, but nevertheless, capable of some really good things.